Hello and welcome to Naughty Nottingham, Tales from the Bawdy Court. I'm Catherine and I'm one of the archivists at Manuscripts and Special Collections at the University of Nottingham. And today I'm just going to give you a couple of cases from one of our largest and most popular collections, the Archdeaconry of Nottingham, and in particular looking at the church court. Um, the church court was separate from the civil court, so it didn't deal with criminal cases. Um, it was only concerned with religious and moral offences. But in the 17th and 18th century, the church held enormous power over the lives of everyday people. So, for instance, skipping church, drinking or playing games on a Sunday, even gossiping about your neighbours could all potentially land you in trouble. However, most of the cases that were brought before the court were involving some kind of sexual indiscretion, hence its nickname, the Bawdy Court. And one of the most common was uh, for fornication, which is basically sex outside of marriage. Um, punishment involved some kind of public humiliation. Normally the guilty party would have to stand in front of the congregation of their parish church on a Sunday. They would be dressed in white penitence robes, they would be barefoot, and they'd have to stand and confess what they'd done and ask for forgiveness. And that was the usual kind of penance. Um, the dubious honour of performing the last penance in Nottinghamshire for fornication belongs to Thomas and Anne Farrens, and in 1780 this poor couple began their married life having to perform a penance for their premarital sex. Um, usually by this point the church would kind of turn a blind eye if the couple later got married, but unfortunately in this case they really couldn't pretend that they hadn't noticed because this document is a marriage bond so it's an application for a marriage license which means a couple could marry quickly without bans needing to be read for three weeks in church and Thomas was a 21 year old farmer living in West Bridgeford and his bride was an 18 year old living in Gamston and because Anne was 18 and therefore a minor she had to get parental permission to marry and this really long a uh, handwritten text at the bottom is explaining that permission is coming from her mother Elizabeth Morris because her father Samuel is deceased. And the fact that Anne needed parental consent to marry is faintly ridiculous when you realise that Anne had parental responsibility of her own because the wedding took place a day after the licence was granted which was a week before Thomas and Anne's son was baptised in the same parish church. So that is a fairly typical case and you can see that there's quite a lot of family and social history uh, information in a fairly formulaic and routine court document. But the really interesting cases are in the instance causes. Um, and these are for much more serious offences um, and there's a lot more juicy information in the records because the people involved are questioned, um, witnesses give statements, the church lawyers go and gather supporting evidence and documents from places. And this particular case was brought before the church court in 1732, but it actually begins several years earlier. So in early August 1727, the landlord of the White Lion in Nottingham um, rented a room to 21-year-old Robert Boyle and his servant. Everything about Robert Boyle was designed to be flamboyant and attract attention. He was apparently a plump man with broad shoulders um, who liked to wear a black suit with a gold embroidered waistcoat. He had a gold tipped cane. He sometimes wore a white dyed wig and carried a sword. He was also incredibly sociable and generous. So he bought drinks for the other customers of the White Lion pub and he entertained them in the evenings with tales of his life as an army drummer. Um, and often he would take off his waistcoat, roll up his sleeves to reveal his tattoos. He had an RH and a crucifix on one arm and the stoning of St. Stephen on the other. Um, and he would then beat a rhythm on the tables and walls to show off his dexterity. Everything about him was designed to leave an impression. And he certainly didn't seem at all concerned about being memorable. One of Boyle's drinking companions was Beaumont Toppert, and this is his deposition that he gave to the church court. Beaumont was a widower in his 50s, he lived in the parish of St Mary's in Nottingham, 
and he probably had about five surviving children to support. And he believed Boyle's tales that he was an heir to a considerable estate. Um, and so Toppert encouraged a relationship between Robert Boyle and his eldest daughter, Susanna, who was about 18. On the 12th of August, 1727, Boyle applied for and received a marriage license, which allowed the couple to marry quickly with minimal publicity. And there can be many, many innocent reasons for wanting to do this, but unfortunately Boyle's were anything but. So the two were married the day after being granted the license. And within a week of living as man and wife, um, Boyle had taken the £150 that Susanna had been given on her wedding day and fled Nottingham. And that might have been the end of it had word not spread that Susanna was the second bride that Boyle had abandoned that summer. Earlier that year, Margaret Harris had been a 19-year-old living in Biggleswade in Bedfordshire. And according to an anonymous letter sent to Nottingham, she was renowned for her beauty. She had a lot of admirers. Um, and she was also reputed to be in line for a £400 fortune when she turned 21. Boyle seems to have appeared in, in Biggleswade as quickly as he appeared in Nottingham, with very, very little information about what he'd done and where he was from, except that he may have come from Hertfordshire. Um, he probably made Margaret's acquaintance via her brother-in-law, William Greatrix, who was an innkeeper. And in March 1727, this plump, dark-eyed former soldier with a crucifix and RH tattooed on one arm and the stoning of St. Stephen on the other and a plethora of gold accessories began courting Margaret. On the 12th of June, Boyle applied for and received a marriage license and the following day, he and Margaret were married. As a minor, Margaret needed permission um, and that came from William Greatrix, presumably as both of her parents were deceased. And about a month into the marriage, um, Boyle suggested that he and Margaret go on a pleasant carriage ride on a lovely summer's day. Um, 10 miles from their village, Boyle stopped the horses, ordered Margaret out and literally abandoned her by the side of the road. And Margaret's walk back home must have been one of the longest and loneliest journeys that you can imagine. And of course, Boyle was long gone by the time she made it back. And officially, Boyle was only ever accused of taking £60 from Margaret. So it's likely that in that month of marriage, um, he had discovered that there was no big fortune coming and had formulated his plan to leave her. Unfortunately for Margaret, a month of marriage was also long enough for her to fall pregnant and she gave birth to their son, John, in March 1728. Over the next few years, rumours began circulating that Boyle's real name was Handleby, hence the RH tattoo, and that he was a serial bigamist who travelled around using aliases Hannibal and Boyle in an attempt to conceal his crime. It wasn't until 1733 that Susanna petitioned the court to have her marriage annulled on the grounds of bigamy. So all this information we have comes from those church records. We have copies of the marriage licenses, we have depositions and letters from the friends and family of both women, um, we have other documents submitted as evidence, we have the verdict against Boyle, and it all comes from those cases, and it proved that Boyle was a bigamist. So Susanna was successful in getting her marriage annulled, um, and this basically meant that her reputation was free from stain. She was held blameless and she was free to go out and uh, remarry and have legitimate children. And I can tell you that if she did choose to remarry, she didn't do it by licence because her name does not crop up again in the church court records. As for Margaret, um, by the time that the court case came round, she was 26 and there's no mention that her marriage had been annulled. By this point, William Greatrix had died and she and her widowed sister Elizabeth were running a coffee house to support themselves and young John. Boyle was excommunicated in absentia. Um, this document, which you may be able to see, is that excommunication and it's written in Latin. He was also ordered to pay £30 court costs, which the court had no real way of enforcing because nobody knew where he was. 
Um, he never saw either of his wives or his son after he'd abandoned them. And I wish I could give you a slightly neat ending, but unfortunately, that's where our records end. Ordinarily, I'd say that many of the archdeaconry records are available to view in our reading room um, at King's Meadow campus and that we are open to members of the public. You don't have to be a staff or student at the University of Nottingham to come and look at our records. Um, but unfortunately, at the moment, we are closed due to the coronavirus and I'm not sure when we're going to reopen. Um, but if you are interested in finding out more about the Bordy Court, we have lots of resources on our website. Um, there will probably be some links on the slide in this presentation. And so thank you very much. Um, I hope to see you soon and I hope you enjoy the rest of this online version of the Local History and Archaeology Festival.